Thank you for making Locked On Yankees your first listen every day. We're free and available on all platforms. On today's show, it's going to be about Jason Giambi. I know, you're probably wondering, why on earth would Stacy be talking about Jason Giambi? What could there possibly be going on? It's an anniversary, sort of. I'll let you know when the show starts. <laughs> You are Locked On Yankees, your daily New York Yankees podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone. This is Stacey Gatsoulias, Locked On Yankees. It's Monday. It's December 13th. And according to some places, 20 years ago today, Jason Giambi agreed to sign seven-year, $120 million deal with the Yankees 20 years ago. That's insane. Some places say that it's the 13th. Others say it's the 18th. I think the 18th is the day that he officially signed it and was at the stadium, I believe. So I'm going by today, okay? So it's going to be about Jason Giambi. We're going to talk about him. We're going to bring up some games that I went to that he had big performances, games I didn't go to in which he had big performances, it's going to be fun, at least for people who liked Jason Giambi. Most people did, I would think. He seemed like a nice guy. You know, he had the steroid thing, but I mean, how many other Yankees have had the steroid thing? It's not that big a deal anymore, is it? Anyway, you can listen to the show in Apple, Google, Odyssey, Spotify, Stitcher. You can watch us on YouTube. Subscribe. We hit 666 this weekend. Thank you. We surpassed it also. Thank you for that. And if you have a smart device, you can tell it to play Locked on Yankees. So, Jason Giambi. I've told this story before. I'm going to tell it again. I did not want him coming to the Yankees. And now I feel bad because he seems like a good dude. And, uh... You know, it wasn't the best of times for Jason Giambi. The Yankees didn't really do anything while he was here. He kind of fell into the same um, trap as Mike Messina. <laughs> you know, they win um, almost. Moose really, you know, Moose came in 01. The Yankees last won 2000. Giambi comes 2002, leaves in 08, and then the Yankees win in 09. So, you know, similar. He had some good years for the Yankees. He had some not so good years for the Yankees. Had some controversy. Obviously, the Balco thing. He's not the only one who had that controversy. Um, but I liked Jason Giambi as a player. I really did. Uh, he got, he could hit the hell out of the ball. Whew. Some of his home runs were amazing. My goodness. And it's funny, when I, when I watch Luke Voigt, and I think I've said it on the show, it feels like he's a right-handed Giambi, but the way he, like, even facially, he kind of looks like Giambi. And body type and his stance, it's really odd. I think someone should put Voight and Giambi's stances side by side to show everyone the similarities. Because I really, I kind of got freaked out when I saw Luke Voigt at first. I thought, ooh, he's like a right-handed Giambi. That's kind of odd. And, you know, with the way he plays first base, he's really similar to Giambi. No offense. Giambi could really scoop, though. Let me tell you. I was at a few games where Derek Jeter made really crappy throws from shortstop, and Giambi saved his butt by being able to scoop. And I've said this on the show. I'll say it again. I witnessed Jason Giambi turn a 3-6-3 double play. It happened. I witnessed it. I was sitting in my seats in the upper deck, and... I watched it happen and it took a couple of minutes, not minutes, but it took a couple of moments for my brain to process that I saw what I saw. And I said to my friends, did Giambi just turn a 363? Like, did we just see that happen? I've seen triple plays in person. I saw a no hitter in person, Randy Velarde, Randy Velarde in um, 99 with the A's, I believe. He turned a triple play in front of me. And that was another moment where I thought to myself, did I just see that? Did that just happen? Same thing with Giambi hitting or hitting, starting a 6-3, 3-6-3 double play. The hitting, he actually 
accidentally <laughs> hit against the shift. I don't know if it was a check swing. I'm trying to remember, but, you know, they used to do the shift on Giambi all the time because he was such a pull hitter. And, you know, this was back in 05 when, you know, teams would shift for certain players, but not all the time, not as rampant as it is now, where teams are constantly sh- shifting. Um, and he kind of just poked his bat out. Not quite a bunt, but he hit it for a double because no one was on the left side. It went all the way to the wall and the left fielder had to run from center field to get the ball. And, you know, Jambi's not fast. So he it was a double. So I witnessed that in person, too. Yeah. Um, but like I said, I wasn't very happy about Giambi coming over. I was at game five against Oakland at the stadium. Giambi was like four for four. Couldn't stop hitting. My dad joked that Giambi was putting on a show for Steinbrenner. He certainly did because there were rumors that the Yankees were interested in him and he was, you know, linked with the Yankees because he was becoming a free agent and, you know, the Yankees had the money and he was the biggest one. And of course, you know, we saw what happened. It actually happened. But I remember at the time thinking to myself, no, I don't want Tino to go. You know, we don't need Jason Giambi. And, you know, opening day of 02... People were jerks to Giambi. I felt bad. <laughs> Aside from the Cablevision sucks chants that were happening that day, because, you know, the Yes Network launched in 02. The Giambi signing and the, and the launch of the Yes Network were like the big deal heading into the 2002 series, series season. And people who couldn't get Yes, anyone with Cablevision, they started a Cablevision sucks chant at Yankee Stadium. I had Time Warner. I was living in Staten Island at the time, so I did not miss Yes. I saw the debut of the Yes Network, which brings me to the day that Jason Giambi won my heart. July 4th, 2002. Yankees, I can't remember who they played, but the first year of Yes, they had a mini studio at Yankee Stadium, and Susan Waldman would interview the players. I don't know where they set it up, if it was near the locker room or what, but Giambi came out in a cut-off T-shirt, sleeves cut off, shorts and adidas slides and he just sat there answering questions about the game because i'm assuming it's because he did something during the game i can't why can't i remember and he just seemed like the nicest dude and i thought okay i'm not gonna i'm gonna stop being a jerk about jason giambi i mean i kind of before that i mean obviously the grand slam against the twins that was a big deal that was cool. I, as I said, I was living in Staten Island. I had a roommate, wanted to scream my head off, but it was late and she was sleeping and I couldn't. Um, that was, that was actually pretty funny. That was a, it, does anyone else remember that game? I'll have to do a deep dive into that game uh, this season because it's going to be 20 years, May 14th. Whew, wow. That's frightening. Anyway, <laughs> we're going to look at some games where Jason Giambi was the star or one of the stars, or maybe he had, you know, a memorable hit. There's one game that has a tie to a TV show that I will tell you about in a minute. And speaking of TV, does this sound familiar? You've got one device that lets you catch the game live, another that lets you stream your favorite shows, you're watching sports highlights on your phone, and you've got your neighbor's best friend's login for the good stuff. Well, I want to tell you about a simple way to get all that entertainment you love without the hassle and a great way to finally get your TV together. It's called Direct TV Stream, and it brings live TV and on-demand favorites together like never before so you can watch your favorite sports movies and shows all in one place that means no more juggling remotes and no need to buy another device ever again and the best part there's no annual contract so get rid of the clutter and the confusion and get your tv together with direct tv stream you can learn more at directtv.com that's directtv.com compatible device is required and the content varies by package Thanks again for making Locked on Yankees your first listen every day. We're free and available on all platforms. So let's, we'll do this in, I was going to do it in a different order, but let's do this in chronological order. So the game that I was teasing that is tied to a TV show occurred on September 4th, 2002. It was the Yankees against the Red Sox in Yankee Stadium. It's a Wednesday night. 50,000 people were there. And why it's tied to a TV show is 
in 2004, after The Sopranos were, they were on a really long hiatus and then they pro- they finally started that season again. One of the characters was watching a baseball game and it was that game, September 4th, 2002. And I recognized it right away because they showed the home run I'm about to tell you about. So let's get into this. Now, th- th- this game was actually funny for other reasons. I'm going to start off with it. Boston Red Sox lineup. Ricky Henderson, left field. That's right. Ricky Henderson. Johnny Damon, center. Nomar, shortstop. Manny Ramirez, right field. Shea Hillenbrand, third. Carlos Baerga was the DH. Jason Veritek, catcher. Tony Clark, first base. Ray Sanchez, second base. And Derek Lowe was your starter. Now, the Ricky Henderson thing has to do with my brother, but I'll get into that in a second. The Yankees lineup, Alfonso Soriano at second, Jeter at short, Giambi was DHing, Bernie Williams was in center, Posada catching, Robin Ventura was playing third, Raul Mondesi was playing right, Nick Johnson first, Juan Rivera left field, and your starting pitcher, Andy Pettit. Because as I joke on this show all the time, Andy Pettit is the pitcher that I've seen the most in my entire life. Regular season, playoff, everything. Unreal how many times I've seen that man. And if I can go through every single game that I've been through, been through, been to since 1996 and try and figure out all the games that I attended in which Andy Pettit was the starter, I wonder, mm, it's got to be like 50. (laughs) You think I'm crazy when I say that, but I had... Two playoff cycles where Andy Pettit was the only pitcher I saw start. So like three games each, you know? So it's possible. And with regular season games, depending on, um, you know, if his starts landed on a Sunday or if I went to a random weekday game, I would bet that it is probably around 50. That's crazy. That's a lot. That's a lot. I mean, the only pitcher I've seen more as Mo, obviously, because he's closed out so many games. But yeah, Andy Pettit, man. Woo. So let's see. Wait, what did I say? September. That's right. So what was happening here? The Yankees were 86 and 52. The Red Sox were 77 and 60. Right. Okay. Yeah. Oh, two. That division series was a bummer. Okay. So the, the game was, let's see. Manny Ramirez. That's right. He hit a single that scored Johnny Damon in the first inning. So the Red Sox actually went up first, but that would be the only run they scored. The bottom of the third, Juan Rivera led off with a double. Soriano was hit by a pitch. Then Jeter hit into a ground ball double play, but Juan Rivera made it to third. And then Jason Giambi hit a home run to left field, where we were sitting right by the left field foul pole. That is the clip that they showed on The Sopranos, and that's why I knew it right away. I knew exactly what game it was, because it wasn't that often that Jason Giambi hit home runs to left field right by the foul pole. So it was just funny watching The Sopranos in my apartment in Manhattan, thinking, I was at that game. That's so cool. The Yankees actually ended up winning 3-1, because he put them up 2-1 with that, and then Jorge Posada hit a single off low that scored Bernie Williams, and that was it. It was a pretty boring game other than that, but it's kind of cool that it ended up being on TV. Now, the connection with Ricky Henderson, my brother was heckling him because we were pretty close to the field and Ricky Henderson did not appreciate it. And then Ricky Henderson stuck his middle finger up at my brother, but sneakily, not going to do it, but I'll just put my hand like he was like this, but sticking his middle finger up. So my brother was sticking his middle finger back at Ricky Henderson Then a cop came over to my brother, took him away for a second, and I thought, oh my God, I'm going to be trapped here. And uh, and then my brother said, yeah, the cop said I have to keep my hands on my lap and I can't do anything else to Ricky Ricky Henderson. And then Ricky Henderson started with my brother again and I had to little, literally, if you're you're not watching on YouTube, I am pretending to hold my brother, I wrapped my arms around my brother to hold his arms down because I didn't want to be kicked out of Yankee Stadium. Like, what? No. And we were sitting in front of a really nice family of Yankee fans who were up from North Carolina. 
their father was in a wheelchair and we were near the wheelchair, like they were behind us. And the man took a really nice picture of me and my brother. I still have it. He printed it out, sent it to me at NBC, thought it was the greatest thing. And he wrote a really nice note talking about how funny we were and how much fun they had watching the game with us. And yeah, that was, uh, that was kind of cool. But again, in 2004, when I saw that game, I knew exactly what game it was and thought to myself, wow, that's pretty cool. I'm kind of on The Sopranos, but not really. (laughs) I mean, you know, who else can say that? Uh, 50,006 people, because that was the exact attendance that night. Um, I'm trying to think of other games from 2002. Aside from the playoff games, um, I went to game one and game two of the division series. I went to game one by myself, bought tickets on Ticketmaster, or a ticket on Ticketmaster. I ended up running into six people I knew. And all of them, all of them asked, are you here by yourself? Shocked that I would be at a Yankee game by myself. And then I went the next night with my cousins and my brother, because those were my regular tickets. We had tickets for game two through our season ticket package and the Yankees ended up losing. I think it was eight, six. They left the bases loaded. I think Posada made the last out, you know? And as I said, I was living in Staten Island back then and I didn't get home that night until three. Cause I met up with my neighbor. He knew I was going to the game and we met outside the stadium so we could go home together. And we missed one of the ferries. And he, <laughs> he was like, I really don't want to take a cab home. Is it okay if we hang out here for a while and wait for the next ferry? And I said, yeah. And then I ended up calling my boss from New York Harbor at like 2.15 in the morning and said, I missed the ferry if I'm late tomorrow. I'm sorry. Or if I'm late later in the morning, I'm sorry. But I wasn't. I made it to work because I was a good worker. Believe it or not, I was a good worker. You know what else is good? Built Bar. This holiday season, grab the protein bar that tastes like a candy bar or even better than a candy bar. Some of them, yes. They're low in calories, sugar, net carbs, and fat, but they're high in protein, so you get the best of both worlds. They're divi- <laughs> what? delicious and healthy. Sorry about that. It's Monday, okay? My mouth is not working. It has so many flavors. Raspberry, mint brownie, cherry, double chocolate, cookies and cream, peanut butter brownie. That's a good one. Built Bar gives you extra fuel. So if you need to go holiday shopping still and uh, get on that, people, it's December 13th. You'll have extra fuel with a Built Bar. Uh, You want to cozy up with something warm? Dip that Built Bar into a piping hot cup of cocoa. Let it melt a little and give your beverage a bit of that Built Bar flavor. Mint brownie in hot cocoa must taste amazing, and I'm going to have to try that. But just be sure you have a couple of napkins on hand. Um, If you go to Built Bar... If you go to built.com, excuse me, use our promo code LOCKED15 and you'll get 15% off your order. That sounds so good, though. Especially the mint brownie in hot chocolate. I know not everyone likes mint like I do, but again, go to built.com, use our promo code LOCKED15, and you'll get 15% off your order. Now, I joked about betting earlier, but Bet Online has you covered all season, has more props, odds, and lines than ever before as football season continues its march to the playoffs. Bet Online remains your number one spot for all the sports action this season. Head to their new updated desktop or mobile website to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code LOCKED ON to receive that bonus. From basketball, football, NHL, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games, don't wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available for the 2021 season. Bet online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports. Bet online, where the game starts. Speaking of football, um, are the refs betting on games? I mean, why, why are they so insistent on helping Tom Brady win? I'm not even a Bills fan, and I was annoyed yesterday. Like, what? It was so blatant. What are they doing? Oh, my goodness. Ugh. And I feel bad for my Bills fan friends. Sorry, guys. I have some Bills Yankees fan friends. So, guys, I'm sorry that yesterday sucked. But, ugh. I mean, come on. Give me a break here. Now, let's see. Okay, July 10th, 2005. I've told this story, too. 
it was a oh, it was so hot that day that I didn't want to sit in my upper deck seats. And then my friend let me know that she had loge seats. And she said, sit with me in the loge. Maybe you can get rid of your tickets somehow. I said, okay, I'll go. All right, let's go. I'll go to the stadium on a hot Sunday <laughs> afternoon, but I'll sit in the loge out of the sun. My old seats were in the upper deck. I would have been in the sun all day. I had an incident one year where they nearly had to call the EMTs on me because I was dehydrated and almost fainted. So I was all about sitting in the loge. So we're walking around the stadium. I see a couple, the girl's hysterically crying and the guy is trying to calm her down. And me being the nosy person that I am, I wanted to make sure she was okay. And they explained to me that they were sold counterfeit tickets, I guess, or like fake tickets. And I said, I have tickets in the upper deck. Um, I can give them to you right now. And then I'll come up later and I'll, you know, I'm, I'm not going to charge you full price because you lost money on these tickets that you bought. Um, so I'll come up during the game. And then I joked with them and said, just make sure you drink water because it's really hot and you're in the sun all day. And they said, okay. Um, I don't even, I don't even think I exchanged numbers with them now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah, no, I didn't even give them my cell phone number. I just, you know, was going to go up to my seats. I mean, they could have, who knows, they could have been tricking me and then I would have been screwed out of money. What was I thinking? (laughs) They could have duped me. They could have been acting, but they weren't. So sitting in the loge with my friend, I, I only sat in the loge two times I started going to games in 1983. Stadium closes in 2008. That's a long time to only sit in the loge twice. 1984 and 2005. That's crazy. Then again, I only sat in the right field bleachers once in 1984. And the left field bleachers once in 2005. What's with the time gaps there? So odd. Anyway, so July 10th, 2005 was the Yankees against the Cleveland Indians. Randy Johnson against Jake Westbrook. Remember Jake Westbrook? He was kind of like a big dude. Um, Here are your lineups. Grady Sizemore. There's someone who was constantly injured and had a very rough MLB career. Coco Crisp. Travis Hafner, who nearly killed me in 2007. I'll tell that story in a second. Victor Martinez. Casey Blake. Jose Hernandez. Ronnie Belliard. Johnny Peralta. Aaron Boone. Third base. (laughs) And as I said, Jake Westbrook was your pitcher. For the Yankees, Jeter, Cano, Sheffield, A-Rod, Matsui, Giambi, Ruben Sierra, John Flaherty, Melky Cabrera, and then, oh, that's right, because Randy Johnson was pitching. That's right. I forgot. He was his personal pitcher. Johnson did not get along with Posada. Fun times. Anyway. (laughs) Start time weather, 83. No, it was hotter. I don't know what this, I don't know what baseball reference is saying, but it was hot that day. It was gross. I remember it was definitely hotter than 83. Although the wind was 16 miles an hour left to right. And they say it was cloudy, but it was not cloudy. I was there that day, I remember. So the Indians actually scored first. Travis Hafner hit a double and it scored Sizemore, who would hit a double to lead off the game. In the top of the second, Aaron Boone hit a double that scored Hernandez and Cleveland went up 2-0 at that point. John Flaherty hit a sack fly that scored Matsui in the bottom of the second to cut the lead to 2-1. And then Jason Giambi, bottom of the fourth. Matsui reaches on an E6. And then Jason Giambi, and I'm not exaggerating, okay? And I hope there's film of this somewhere. He hit a home run off Jake Westbrook. That looked like it was still going up when it landed in the right field bleachers. It was a bomb. And I had a perfect view of it from the loge because we were near the right field foul pole. It, that thing should have had a flight attendant on it. It was unbelievable because it was warm out. So the ball was carrying, but it was unbelievably, <laughs> I mean, my God, and that was when Giambi was kind of waking up because he had a rough 2005 with the Balco stuff. And then his season started off slow. And then he slowly started hitting home runs. And July was the month where he had like 12. And I think every game that I went to in July, he hit a home run. This was one. And he had, let's see, I think it was July 4th. He had two home runs right against Baltimore. And I saw him hit two home runs against the Angels at the end of the month. And it was just a crazy thing. So he was waking up at the plate and, oh, 
I mean, that ball just, I still to this day, it's 16 years later, and I can't believe how hard he hit that ball. Um, then Hafner hit a sack fly that tied the game at 3-3. The bottom, and that was in the top of the fifth. Bottom of the fifth, Matsui hit a double. Scored chef. A-Rod made it to third. Giambi was intentionally walked because Jake Westbrook was like, I don't want a part of that. <laughs> Ruben Sierra, or Rubain, as my dad would say, hit a single that scored both A-Rod and Matsui. Giambi only made it to second because, you know, uh, I joked about Jorge Posada running like he had a full diaper with a piano strapped to his back. Giambi was similar. Actually, Giambi ran like a cartoon character where it looked like just his legs were moving and not his arms. Picture it. You're picturing it. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Top of the seventh, Travis Hafner. What is with Hafner? Why don't I remember Travis Hafner being a pain in the ass that day? Like I said, he almost killed me in 2007. Um, hit a single that scored Sizemore. And wait, hold on. Did I miss something? Oh, no, I didn't miss anything. Okay. So after the Sierra um, single, the Yankees were up 6-3. Okay, because I was looking at the score going, wait, what's happening? Okay. So Hafner makes it 6-4. And then that's the closest that they would get because in the bottom of the eighth, Gary Sheffield hit a three run home run to put the Yankees up nine four. Then Mo came in, got Boone to ground out, Sizemore to strike out looking, Coco Crisp to strike out looking. So yeah, fun times. And then the last game, I'll mention this quick, August 28th, 2005, another game where Jason Giambi hit two home runs. This was an interesting one because it was baby Zach Greinke against old man Al Leiter. <laughs> I'm, no offense to Al Leiter, but, you know, at, at that point in 2005, he was old and Zach Greinke was a baby. Um, the Yankees won 10-3, uh, but Giambi had seven runs batted in. And I used to do things for a website back then, and we did a Photoshop of the Yankee Stadium scoreboard and put Giambi 7, Royals 3. So clever. Now, the funniest thing about that day was I went with my friends Kyle and Jen. Kyle listens to this. Hello, Kyle. He remembers this well. We were going up the escalators, up to the seats, and Jen said, I'm feeling Giambi mojo today. I don't know. I feel like he's going to have a big day. She was right. <laughs> she was very right. Like I said, he had two home runs. He ran. He ran. He drove in seven runs. He also had... Um, a run scoring single as well on top of the two home runs. So yeah, that was uh, pretty cool. And what was funny about that was two days before that was my birthday, August 26th. It was a Friday. I went with my best friend at the time. Her favorite player was Bernie Williams and Bernie Williams had a good game that night. And Giambi, not that he was bad. I think he walked a couple of times, but he didn't do anything. And it felt like Giambi gave me a belated birthday present on August 28th, 2005. So yeah, there's my Jason Giambi show. I love Jason Giambi. I really do. I still do. I, you know, his first old timers day, I was there because I, before COVID, I had a 22 year old timers day streak that got ruined. Although I don't think, it, does that count? Because they haven't had old timers day. So I think my streak will continue, right? Anyway, I must have taken 75 pictures of that man. I was so happy that he was at old timers day. I was sitting way the hell up in the upper deck too behind home plate. I think it was only like three rows away from the top of Yankee Stadium. And, you know, I had my phone. It wasn't like I had a camera with a telephoto lens or, you know, good zoom. And, you know, you know Giambi right away anyway. Like, even if you don't see the number on the back of the jersey, you know his body type. He still looked the same. And, yeah, I would say I took about 75 pictures of that man that day. So, yeah, that's my Jason Giambi episode. I love that guy. I thought he was great. And... I can't wait for more old timers days and for him to come back. And, you know, I would really like to see Jason Giambi be a baseball coach manager. Um, I know that people were kind of hoping that he would be. And I know that his name was thrown around a few times for different managerial openings like a couple years ago. But him and his wife have young kids and I know he probably wants to stay home with them. So it will it'll be a while before he becomes a coach, but he's going to become He'll be an MLB manager someday, and I think he'll be pretty good at it. I'm putting it out there right now. Putting it out into the universe, Jason Giambi. You're going to be an amazing MLB manager. 
So that's it for this episode of Locked On Yankees, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'd like to remind you that you can listen to the show in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Odyssey, Spotify, Stitcher, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can watch and subscribe to us on YouTube. And when you get into your car, you can tell your smart device to play podcast Locked On Bets. Now make your second listen of the day Locked On Bets, your daily one-stop shop for all your gambling needs. Locked On Bets is hosted by your boy Q with expert analysis and insight from Lee Sterling. One more thing, if you could be so kind, please rate the podcast and spread the word about this podcast to your fellow Yankee fans. We would really appreciate it. Enjoy your Monday, and I will talk to you all tomorrow.